All right, we're back. Welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're back with Matt. Um, he's uh, still in Philadelphia, and he just told me it's very hot there, um, which, which might be a contrast to wherever we are. Um, but uh, we are back for a question and answer session, and uh, I'm really looking forward to this, even more than the keynote, actually, because I think this is going to be really good to get to the depths of things. Um, and what I want to do is we, are, we put back the questions that were not answered after the keynote, and we'll get to those in a moment. But I, what I would like to start with, Matt, is, is just to, to ask you, maybe we can unpack uh, this advanced and deep learning, deep reinforcement learning, a little bit more. I mean, you said uh, in your talk that TD Gammon already had the ingredients, but somehow it didn't get there. And something mm -hmm. happened then, right? towards DQN that made it happen. And maybe you could unpack that a little bit and then we go into the questions. Yeah, I, um, so the there are a number of reasons. Oops, now we lost Matt, that's not good. Okay, uh, that's unexpected. Let's see whether he comes back up. Um, hmm. He's still showing us on screen. Oh, you still see me. Um, maybe I'll just drop you off the screen real quick and, and get you back up. I'm not sure why that happened. Ah, I think we have you back. I have no idea what just happened. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, we got you back on. Sorry, so so we actually didn't get to hear much what you were saying because no, you were I, 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 about two words and then you were gone. <laughs> that was strange. Yeah, no, I, I dropped off my own screen, so I knew something was wrong. You can hear me. Yeah, yeah, no, okay, perfect. All right, all right, let's try again. Yeah. I'm not sure what happened. Yeah, so, um, so. Uh, uh, there are there are really a number of interrelated reasons why um, uh, reinforcement learning uh, algorithms um, didn't mix well with. It, it's not just deep learning; it's nonlinear function approximation in general. And and what it, what they all come down to is the the fact that the data in reinforcement learning is not stationary. It's not like uh, you know most machine learning. Most machine learning techniques require IID data, um, in, uh, identically and independently um, distributed data. And um, by, by construction, the data in, in RL is not like that because uh, you have an agent that's operating in an environment where uh, states are correlated and, um, and the behavior of this agent is also structured over time. And, um, and it's that correlation that causes the instabilities. And, and the reason is that, um, at least with the temporal difference algorithms that were the focus for most research around the time that um, this function approximation was being tried, you have a target, which is, uh, which is the, the, the reward, um, it, well, it's your, your reward prediction error is broken down into your old estimate and your new estimate. And you're trying, you, know, the, the, you, need to, you need to update both of those, right? And the problem is that, that there's a little bit of circularity in that. So you can end up, that's where the, that's where the divergence comes from in these algorithms. So, so um, I, I recognize that might have not been so transparent, but maybe this will help. The solutions have to do with, uh, with smoothing the data distribution. So for example, uh, I mentioned in my presentation briefly that replay is an important uh, mechanism. So rather than yeah. just exposing the agent to new experiences, you cache its old experiences and you replay those intermittently. M maybe this is related to what uh, hippocampal replay is doing in the brain. Of course, a lot of people have speculated about that. But in any event, in machine learning terms, that tends to smooth the data distribution over time. And the, and the other trick that was used uh, in DQN the, the Atari ar architecture was to split the architecture into two copies. So there was the, the, um, the agent that's, uh, that's updating its parameters uh, with new experiences. And then there's like an older version of the same agent that's, giving, that's, um, that's serving up the value predictions that are driving reward prediction errors. 
And by splitting things into uh, a kind of fast changing current state agent and a slow changing target agent, um, that that uh, eased the, this problem of circularity. As far as I know, it's still the case that deep RL is not guaranteed to converge. Um, right. in, in, like there aren't any deep RL algorithms that are guaranteed to converge. That there are convergence guarantees for classical RL algorithms in the tabular case, but with nonlinear function approximation, there are still no guarantees. And in fact, many jobs in a standard deep RL uh, experiment will diverge and you have to throw them away. Um, but what's happened is things have become more stable. So, you know, maybe 70% uh, yeah. of your agents end up coming up with a good solution. I see. Now, I, I push my luck a little bit more with, with one follow up and then, then we get to other questions. But um, if I was the, the devil's advocate, I would say, okay, these are kind of tricks we have learned to kind of make it work. So what gives us the confidence that this has anything to do with the brain? Mm. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, <laughs> it's, I, you know, it's, it's completely an empirical question. I mean, we don't even know whether uh, the brain is using a similar um, learning algorithm for doing the nonlinear function approximation. We, I, 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 I made the assertion in my, in my lecture that deep reinforcement learning is not synonymous with back propagation. Uh, you know, I use the term deep RL to refer to any combination of RL with, um, with a deep neural network trained by whatever means. But in practice, it's definitely the case that the vast majority of deep RL work uses back prop. And, uh, you know, back prop has its own dynamics and its own pitfalls. And, uh, you know, I'm, I think it's still an open question whether the brain is doing something like that or something completely different. So, um, yeah, this is, I mean, it's just an empirical question. On the other hand, um, I do think that it's intriguing that uh, one of the key uh, tricks of the trade, as you said, um, that's gotten this whole thing to work more reliably is replay. And, right. uh, and, and in fact, the, um, the, 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 the literature on replay in AI and the literature on replay in neuroscience are really interestingly parallel right now. So for example, you know, around the same time that people started thinking about prioritized replay in AI, people were, were thinking about prioritized replay in neuroscience. And it's one of the, so it's one of the few cases where the neuroscience literature and the AI literature are sort of neck and neck on a particular issue. But, yeah, uh, but, but surely it's an empirical question whether these, uh, these methods that we're relying on are, 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 are ones that the brain's using, for sure. All right, good, thank you very much. Uh, so we, we continue with uh, one of the questions that wasn't answered after the keynote, and I, I brought Alexandra up because she was asking the question originally. Yes, hello, so thank you very much. Hello, welcome on screen, on stage. Uh, please ask your question. Um, I think my question was just answered with uh, the explanation you just gave about the replays to an extent, because I was um, from what I gathered from your talk was that we have a very good evidence that uh, this meta reinforcement learning matches a lot of the experimental observations. And I was wondering um, what that implies in terms of the underlying mechanism of the brain. Uh, the, when I think about learning, I always think about updating synapses and the learning mechanisms that takes place in the synapse yeah. level. So that was my question, but I think you kind of addressed it with the, uh, this idea about replays. Well, I can add one thing. So. Um, uh, there is one thing. Uh, so in our in our paper on meta RL, um, our our proposal uh, is that um, dopaminergic do dopamine driven learning, uh, which which we assume based on the kind of pre prevailing story in the literature, involves synaptic change in the striatum through a sort of three factor learning rule. Um, our proposal is that rather than serving to adjust stimulus response association strengths, which is the usual uh, assumption about dopamine, instead what dopamine is doing is uh, changing the effective conductivity of prefrontal circuits uh, so that those prefrontal circuits have dynamics that, uh, that implement another RL algorithm. It, I, I, I've just restated what I described in my, in my talk. But, there's one 
there is one, uh, um, there, there's something that has to be true of the brain in order for that proposal to be viable. And that is that uh, dopamine driven synaptic change has to be slow. So we're still solving for the credit assignment problem. It's just that go, that goes through dopamine, but it's still oh, yes. synaptic uh, changes. Um, yes. And the learning happens at the level of the synapse. It, so learning happens at the level of the synapse. So in the model, reinforcement learning, the reinforcement learning algorithm that we're using is adjusting the synaptic strengths. And that, that's intended to be a simple model of how dopamine is influencing synaptic change in the brain. Mm -hmm. But, but the, the, the key thing, and, this, and I didn't mention this in my talk, although we, we stress it in the paper, that, that the, like the learning rate on that process has to be very low. And, and the reason is that um, the kind of credit assignment that is involved is um, has to it has to effectively average or aggregate across many tasks. In other words, it can't just be it, the the larger your learning rate. Um, a learning rate basically governs the effective uh, averaging window, uh, right? Like the the kind of the the window of time during which uh, events influence synaptic change. So if you have a very low learning rate you're aggreg aggregating over a very large amount of data, mm -hmm. right? If you have a high learning rate, then you're basically just updating that based on the last few events that you've witnessed and uh, washing out uh, the impact of earlier learning. So in the meta RL story, it's really necessary that dopamine driven synaptic change be very slow. And I actually spent some time, I'm not a synaptic neurophysiologist, but I spent some time when I was working on that paper reading the the um, the physiology literature to see whether this hypothesis was viable. And I was actually quite surprised at how, um, first of all, how little we know about, about the time scale of dopamine driven learning, but also how much evidence there actually is that that kind of learning is, is remarkably slow. It's on, you know, there are numerous papers that suggest that it's on the, on the time scale of hours not milliseconds, which is what you would assume to be necessary if dopamine were, driven, were driving, say, performance updates in a bandit task. So, so, so that's an important thing um, that's, that, that's implied by our theory. Okay, thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, so I'll let you go, Alexandra. Um, yes. the, the next question uh, was from Petrud Bogdan. Uh, he's not online right now, so I'll, I'll read it out to you. I think it's an interesting question. Um, do the meta reinforcement learning approach or learning to learn represent the direction in which the AI community is heading? And what other neuroscientific knowledge do you think is not yet seen in the AI field but looks promising? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I would say that uh, meta learning is meta learning in general is very much a direction that the AI community is going um, around the so. Meta learning has been an uh, an intensive area of uh, research in machine learning for you know since the 1990s, um, and uh, but there was a there was a sort of um, uh, burst of interest in in meta learning around the time that we came out with our paper. Not because of us; it was just sort of a number of people got interested in meta learning at the same time, and. Um, uh, and the, the, the combination of meta-learning with reinforcement learning, yielding these kind of meta-reinforcement learning algorithms was, I, I, I guess, a, a new thing. Um, but uh, but the, the interest of meta-learning in general has, been, has persisted. So uh, I'll, say, I'll say one more specific thing about it, though, uh, which is that for a while, at least, uh, meta-learning was treated as something for which special algorithmic innovations would be necessary. Um, mm -hmm. Need to build meta-learning algorithms. And, and there's still, there's still um, a lot of very innovative and often very fascinating work relating to how to do that, how to endow a system, a, a, maybe a deep reinforcement learning system with me meta-learning abilities by engineering it differently from some more yeah. generic learning system. But actually, um, what, my personal perspective uh, is that we don't really need to do that. The, the thing that I found most enlightening about playing with these recurrent networks that we were playing with in our meta-learning work 
is that in fact they contain no special mechanisms. Um, as I as I explained in my talk, it's just an ordinary recurrent neural network. All that's all that's special about it is that it gets this input that tells it what reward it got on the last time step, which doesn't seem like such a huge innovation in itself. Uh, and it's trained in a multitask environment, which is also really nothing, that's no innovation on the agent side. It's just an assumption about the environment. And it turns out that if you have those ingredients, you have a multitask environment, you have an agent with memory, so it can be it can be activity based memory in a recurrent network, or it can be a, a slot based memory of the kind that I mentioned toward the end of my talk. Um, and you train the system uh, um, using reinforcement learning, or or it, it could even be a supervised case. Um, you will get meta learning. It's just an emergent property of these systems. And so I also I, I'll say one more thing about this. So um, I mentioned toward the, I think in answer to a question at my talk, I mentioned. Uh, the large scale language models that are um, that are uh, a real focus of AI research over the last uh, um, couple months. And if you look at um, uh, uh, GPT-3, uh, one of the most advanced uh, large language models that's um, recently been recorded, it, it's actually described by its creators as a meta learning system. Um, it, right. uh, it, it, it's a language processing system um, but it's a meta learner in the sense that you feed in some text, which, effe it, which effectively it, uh, gives it a local training signal. It can learn from, say, a couple of examples of a problem, and then you ask it a new question, and given the context that you've provided, it can do better. So, so and, and there again, this language model was not built to be a meta learner. There's no special algorithm in it um, that does meta-learning. It's just that it has memory and it learns to use it effectively. And that spontaneously gives rise to meta-learning. I think that's the insight that's starting to percolate through the community. And it's definitely relevant to neuroscience because it means that as long, I, I just said, any system that has memory that's trained or learns in a multitask environment is gonna do meta-learning. And you don't, yeah, you don't have to add this extra layer outside which learns with a different learning rule and what's so on, right? So that's that, right. That, that, the, brain is, the brain is almost guaranteed to be doing this. And I, I should mention, by the way, before I before I don't I, I, I we should move on to another question. But I should I should acknowledge that the whole idea of meta learning came originally from uh, um, from animal behavior research. Uh, a, a, a researcher named Harry Harlow um, did experiments in the 1940s, uh, which led to him coining the term learning to learn. And in fact, we simulated some of his experiments in our Nature Neuroscience paper. So the whole idea came from from uh, animal behavior and neuroscience in the first place. Good, thank you very much. Uh, that was uh, what's a really interesting uh, bit. Um, I was trying to invite um, Rong Chen to the screen, but it, it seems he's not uh, not coming up because he had a question that's very related to a second rank question here uh, from Yazin, who is not here. So I'll, I'll read out the question uh, myself. The, the question here is the, the link between reinforcement learning in its current incarnations and whether it might ever merge with predictive processing accounts of the brain and Bayesian accounts of the brain. Yeah. Um, yes and yes. So um, when it comes to predictive coding, um, I mean, there's a there's a maybe an interesting sense in which reinforcement learning is inherently a predictive uh, form of representation, right? I mean, it's all about uh, um, pre predicting reward. Um, uh, the maybe more interesting though, uh, there's, uh, there's a lot of work um, happening recently uh, that aims to augment reinforcement learning with, uh, with, represent with, with auxiliary losses that drive good representation learning. And those those losses are often about prediction. Um, so, uh, um, uh, for example, there's a, a very uh, interesting architecture that was proposed by my colleague Greg Wayne, nicknamed Merlin, which uh, which has a reinforcement learning component. But the reinforcement learning agent operates on uh, a state representation, which is learned um, ba based uh, exclusively on a prediction loss. 
So it's a it's a variety of um, variational uh, um, uh, uh, variational encoder, but instead of an auto encoder, it's uh, aiming to to uh, predict the next frame in uh, in the video input. So um, and and these uh, you know often what's meant by predictive coding is also that there's a distributional representation, and in fact these generative models. Uh, and this is related to the beta VAE that I mentioned in my in my talk. Um, actually, have distributional representations. So there's a there's a, a Bayesian flavor to to this kind of prediction driven representation learning. So um, so 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 the two are actually quite uh, they're they're being explored very much in tandem. Um, uh, the the only other thing that I want to um, mention, and this is something that I I mentioned only in passing in my um, in my lecture, is that. Uh, the meta reinforcement learning mechanism um, that I described uh, really can be viewed very immediately and literally as um, yielding a Bayesian um, inference mechanism, and um, and that that comes from an analysis mainly of the training situation because because the because the tasks that the agent is being given are drawn from a distribution. The agent has an inference problem, which is to essentially guess which task from the distribution it is now performing, uh, and and that leads through um, standard uh, deep learning mechanisms to a system that makes rational inferences from its observed data. So, so there, are, I mean, these are all sorts of these are all very different ways in which deep RL. Uh, is um, related to predictive coding, um, and I haven't seen any systems that directly implement um, the kinds, the, like literally the kinds of ideas that say Carl Friston has been uh, describing for many years. But uh, there are definitely connections for sure. Okay, thank you. Uh, now I wonder, um, does that uh, wrong? Does that answer your question, or did you did you have a follow up uh, uh, question on this? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is a wrong wrong chain from user Marilyn. So actually, my question is whether because I'm do lots of uh, modeling work based on probabilistic graphic model, such as Bayesian network. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm wondering whether whether yeah. actually, actually reinforced learning is uh, can be formulated under this framework because we can treat like pre-training or the task distribution as the the the, the prior distribution, right? So then yeah. the whole, the, these two area, we can bridge these two areas together, have a new like a, a Bayesian uh, framework of a reinforced learning or vice versa. So that's my yeah. question. Okay. Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, I mean, there, there I, I think there are a lot of people at DeepMind and elsewhere who are interested in that, um, trying to bridge those two perspectives. And uh, it, in general, um, there, there's a term that often comes up in, in trying to make that connection, which is amortized inference. So That's often, you, often what you end up with, so I'm sure you'll be familiar with this concept, but just for the benefit of the larger group, um, often what you end up with in uh, deep learning is a system that can be understood as um, doing inference uh, on some sort of uh, probabilistic model, but um, but it, the system has sacrificed the, it, the flexibility to, to um, to uh, to answer any query on a probabilistic model in favor of uh, sort of um, uh, uh, learning a learning a function that will uh, efficiently um, answer a particular set of queries. So so um, and, and so so it's not it doesn't end up being exactly the same thing, uh, but it does end up having a relationship to the uh, to the graphical model case. The thing the thing that um, I I um, the thing that you give up, uh, which is which is a little worrisome, really, is that flexibility. So if you have a if you have a graphical model representation of the generative process, you could, in principle, answer questions that you've never been asked before, right? You could condition on variables that you've never been asked to condition on because you have the entire model and you and, and the structure is represented. Whereas in deep learning, um, it's not so clear how, be, because the system is trained on the queries and the answers to the queries, um, it, it's not so clear unless your data set covers all the possible combinatorics, uh, how you could end up uh, answering uh, kind of qualitatively new questions about a system that you've learned about. But 
Um, but it's it's sort of an open question whether that sort of flexibility could eventually emerge if the data sets get large and rich enough that um, you kind of uh, you know inference kind of fills in in the gaps. The other thing that I I think is an open question is when you when you have a graphical model, the inference that happens within such a structure is by definition highly structured. Uh, the 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 graphic the graphical structure constrains the operations so that they remain on the manifold of you know a sort of uh, um, of the of the posterior distribution. Whereas uh, in a in a using the distributed representations that you get in deep learning systems, it, you're not as guaranteed to um, to uh, to to remain constrained to that structured uh, inference space. And so um, so I, I think it's an open question how far we can get with deep learning toward the kind of structured inference that happens in 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 graphical models, and that you know honestly happens in a lot of human cognition. Um, and these are things that you know I think AI researchers are discussing every day, but open questions. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Wang. Um, I I have uh, we have discovered uh, the original uh, question ask asking person Fad under a different yeah. username, and I've tried to invite him on screen. He should be he should be uh, coming on in any second. Um, hopefully. Accepted and connecting, yeah. I hope that does it. It's always a bit of a delay, as we have already discovered. Yeah. Um, uh, but yeah, it, it, it is a fascinating area for sure. Um, where where things are coming together at this point, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, it's satisfying when you can. Um, I mean, it, it's satisfying when you can gain insight. Um, into the operation of these these deep learning models, and that, that's not it's not always possible, uh, you know. Especially, I mean, especially when things are um, uh, built in a gigantic way to operate on extremely messy, gigantic data sets. Um, and you know, that's 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 one of the sort of for scientists. I I, I remember somebody saying to me after I'd been at DeepMind for maybe a year. Um, he said, he said, Matt, it's going to be hard for you here because you're a scientist. Right. <laughs> and I, I didn't really know what he meant, but I like scientists want to understand things. <laughs> um, it, it took me a long time to really um, understand that the, the priorities in engineering are just different. They're, they're about performance. And it's not that engineers don't want to understand, but, um, you know, for a scientist to have something that works that you don't understand, that's a failure. The, the understanding is the, is the coin of the realm. Um, and, uh, it's the opposite. It's the opposite for, for an engineer. And so, yeah, so, so, I mean, but there's a lot of discussion about, about, um, uh, you know, gaining insight into these systems. And of course it comes up when AI systems are applied in settings that involve fairness. Uh, and yeah. you know, I'm sure everybody's familiar with those debates. So, okay, good. So we have, we have our question asker. Yes, we have him now here. So, so please go ahead and ask the question. Hi, uh, am I audible? Yes, you are. Yeah, thanks, Matt. Uh, thanks for the talk. So uh, my question is, you mentioned uh, the meta reinforcement learning as being a Bayesian learner. So where do you think the uh, intersection between reinforcement learning and episodic memory, for instance, happens? Because uh, episodic memory, in one sense, is the arrangement of experiences in time. And that's one thing reinforcement learning uh, kind of wants to optimize the arrangement of probabilistic states in time. So is there any connections between those two? Um, yes, I wish there were more. So what um, there, there's a tendency, at least at DeepMind, to use the term episodic memory to refer to these slot-based memory uh, um, caches that uh, I mentioned in passing when I mentioned the, the differential neural computer. Um, and uh, and the, there is definitely a kind of intriguing, um, uh, you know, resemblance on some dimensions between these kinds of RAM-like uh, memory structures and episodic memory as we use that term in cognitive psychology and neuroscience. But at the same time, there are really dramatic differences. So. Um, you know, real biological episodic memory is highly associative, uh, and 
and and more importantly, and and this you you know you brought this up in the way that you phrased your question. Episodic memory for humans is very very tied to time. It, it's you know it um, a lot of a lot of my favorite research in cognitive psychology on episodic memory uh, deals with uh, the topic of context representations. So when I you know if I if I rem if I try to remember what I had for breakfast this morning. I'm very likely to um, then spontaneously retrieve information about other things that were going on around that same time. Uh, and people like Michael Kahana, uh, a former colleague of mine at Penn, have done fascinating research showing that you know if you if you give people a list of items to remember and then you have them re recall a particular item, and th then there will be a tendency for them to recall the item that came next in the sequence. And, and, that, and that tendency is stronger than their, their tendency to remember the item that came just before. So there's sort of this forward, this forward pressure in time. And so, but my, my high level point is that um, human episodic memory is, uh, is, very, is very linked with this kind of arrow of time and, and the issue of temporal context. And I don't think that we've really, um, I don't think we've really delved into that uh, that aspect of episodic memory in um, in AI, and and for that reason, I don't think um, I don't think our AI systems really have a human-like representation of uh, of time. Uh, I don't think that there's any. I mean, I've I've asked my colleagues from time to time, what would it mean for for us to build an agent that understood what it meant for something to ha have happened yesterday. Um, and, and I mean, I, I'm going to kind of spiral off into um, philosophy here for a minute, but I actually think that that um, that this is really important for for metacognition. So, um, you know, if you this is about understanding how your own memory works. If you if you know something, and I ask you, how do you know that? Uh, you're liable to refer back to an earlier experience that you had, right? So, you know. Oh, how do I know um, that uh, you know that um, the uh, the um, the governor of Oklahoma uh, tested positive for COVID? Oh, well, I saw it on uh, I read it in the New York Times yesterday. I remember reading it. There's metacognition. I understand how how information gets into my own memory, and um, and I think that humans use that kind of metacognitive representation very ubiquitously. To plan communication um, and so forth. So, so these 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 aspects of episodic memory that seem kind of uh, uh, um, what's the right word uh, um, uh, precious or uh, or um, exotic. Uh, I think in the end they're going to be very important for uh, for building artificial general intelligence. L uh, let me just end. I'm taking a long time to answer this question, but let me end with one much more technical um, point, which is that one of the ways in which episodic memory has been used uh, most interestingly in, in, in deep RL uh, is in uh, implementing something called episodic RL, which is, um, it, which is uh, it's an idea that actually came from neuroscience, but worked by Peter Diane. The, the basic idea is in the usual, in the usual setup, uh, reinforcement learning is used to institute very small weight changes that accrue over time. So learning is slow. Uh, but an alternative is to simply cache in an episodic memory store information about past actions and their, their associated rewards. And then uh, you can do like nearest neighbor lookups to very immediately capitalize on uh, previous experiences. And that kind of episodic RL, which capitalizes on an episodic like memory, um, makes RL systems able to cope with much smaller data sets, so they can learn much faster. Good. So hopefully that covers uh, uh, several different perspectives. Yeah, fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Fahd. Um, now, uh, I'll pull up a question here um, uh, where the user doesn't seem to be online. Moritz Möller asked, and it's taking us in a slightly different direction, but I think it, uh, it's a, an interesting one to ask. So it seems that deep RL produces behavior, neural responses similar to those observed in the brain. Does this mean that we understand the brain now? Just a big deep RL machine. Where do, do, do these results leave us? 
Uh, that's a great question. And uh, it's one that I think um, all of us who are interested in these techniques are, are wrestling with. Um, it, it's, it's a question that, uh, that affects not only neuroscience applications, but the, the AI work itself. So um, I think there's a sense, I mean, I, I mentioned uh, the kind of black box flavor of some deep learning systems um, uh, a moment ago. And, uh, you know, after, after AlphaGo, for example, um, uh, there were a lot of conversations at DeepMind about whether it would ever be possible to understand what is going on inside AlphaGo. Um, sure, yeah. And, yeah, and I, think, I think it's still not clear what the answer to that is. Um, uh, it, it may be that uh, with the right kinds of analysis tools, uh, we could gain insight into some sort of um, representational regime that we hadn't previously suspected. On the other hand, uh, it could be that AlphaGo is computing interactions that are so high in degree that the human mind simply can't, uh, you know, can't, in, can't treat them in a way that get, makes us feel like we're getting insight. Um, so, so it's, it's, it's still an open question, even in AI, whether we can, whether we can gain insight. There are, there are some people who, um, for example, um, uh, my friend Conrad Cording, who have proposed that um, in the end, uh, we're gonna have to give up on demanding the kinds of granular understanding that neuroscientists have um, strived for uh, up until now. So, you know, in his view, the kind of Hubel and Weasel model uh, that still serves as the kind of gold standard uh, in neuroscience is we're just going to have to let it go. The, the thing the, we're not going to be able to understand neural computation by looking at individual neurons' receptive fields, for example. The, right. the kind of, what what understanding will be will be something like well, the brain is a big deep learning system that uses this. It, this is the kind of objective function that it's using. Um, and here's the synaptic learning rule that it uses. And then all of that interacts with this very rich, complex data that, that's coming in through the sensory systems. And the outcome of all of that is totally impenetrable. But we can understand the, the high level principles that are at work. I, 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 don't, I don't know. I don't know how I feel about that. Um, uh, a counterexample um, is, in fact, this uh, this new work that I mentioned quickly in my talk, uh, using beta VAEs to look at um, facial representations in uh, in macaque uh, face patch areas. There, the yeah, there's a deep learning system at work, but the deep learning system is regularized in a way that gives rise to representations that are actually pretty transparent to human inspection. Uh, they're disentangled in a way that, you know, you can kind of look at them and go, oh, okay, this unit is quoting from hair length. Um, and so and so even with deep learning, there are particular kinds of deep learning algorithms and objective functions that yield quite understandable um, results. So that's maybe the other side of the argument. But I think I think we still just don't know. Right. But yes, I've seen Cording's paper or, or this paper with a large number of neuroscientists on uh, and uh, machine learners that said, yeah, we, we should just use the methods and language of, of deep learning and describe neuroscience that way and give up on the more granular understanding that we have tried to, to pursue so far. Yeah, so it was a very interesting read, actually. And you weren't on it. <laughs> no, I don't know. no. no I, I, my colleagues, right. my colleagues um, Greg Wayne and uh, and Adam Marblestone wrote a paper that made a, a similar set of points about what, what it will mean to understand biological neural systems. Um, the, the, I, there's one other thing I want to add, though, which is that um, we have a small group within my team at DeepMind that, uh, that aims to uh, understand our deep uh, deep RL systems, and over time their methods have evolved. They started out doing what felt kind of like artificial neuroscience, um, looking at the receptive fields of individual units and um, 
you know, kind of sticking electrodes into our agents. And over time, what they've decided is that um, it's much more powerful to do behavioral probes. Uh, to, so if you have an agent that looks like it's doing something really intelligent, um, a good way of interrogating its knowledge is to put it in some interesting behavioral situation and see what it does. And so, you know, in, it's, it, interestingly, it's turning out that uh, understanding our deep learning systems is not only a matter of doing kind of neuroscience-like uh, probes on them, but also doing psychology-like probes uh, in order to um, to uh, gauge uh, their representations in that way. And then then build up some understanding like we would do in neuroscience, right? Yeah, exactly. And then the insights that you gain from the behavioral probes can give you a, um, a, a more solid ground to go inside and, and look at the underlying mechanisms. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, let's move on. There's there's actually a cluster of questions uh, uh, around uh, successor representations of predictive coding. Oh. So yeah, um, one of them here from Sixian Han uh, was: Do vector-like distributed dopamine signals relate to the successor representation of predictive coding based reinforcement learning? Um, uh, they're That's different. Good. They're they're different. Um, so, uh, in fact, the, the successor representation, in a way, is um, quite like the standard uh, value representation in reinforcement learning, in the sense that it's a, um, an infinite sum, uh, in, uh, uh, it, it's an infinite sum over time steps uh, with a discounting factor. And so the successor representation just takes that, turns it into a vector, and the infinite sum over time steps is no longer for reward, it's for um, the probability of occupying a particular state. Um, at, at least in the simple notion of a successor representation that, uh, that assumes a tabular state representation. So, um, so in, fact, in fact, the logic of these two kinds of representations is, uh, is, is, um, is, is quite different. Um, uh, uh, the once we and it's actually quite difficult to um, to bridge between them. So, um, uh, for example, this uh, expectile based representation um, uh, that 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 we're using to represent the value function. An immediate question would be, well, what about what about just what about distributional representations of other things? Wouldn't it be great to have a representation of the future, which is distributional not only over rewards but also over states, so that I can mm -hmm. I can represent the probability distribution over future situations, uh, and you know that would be a lovely thing to have for a model-based agent. And um, and of course you can do that if you have a a model of the environment and you you know interrogate it using tree search or some other sampling other sampling method method. But what about this kind of um, uh, uh, expectile-based um, uh, mechanism. And it's actually very hard to apply the, the expectile mechanism to, uh, to um, other quantities because it's, it really only works for scalar, for, for distributions over uh, uh, one-dimensional um, quantities. There's no equivalent for vectors. So, so, so actually they're, they're quite different in, they're quite different in, um, uh, in in structure and and implications, um, but like I, I can understand why the question comes up. They both sort of, um, you know, in, take what used to be a, a unitary representation and vectorize it in some way that adds information. But I think they well, do that in different ways. It's different things. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I brought uh, um, a, another participant up here. It's been Deepak. Uh, he had a sl slightly different question. Um, and, and please go ahead and ask it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hi, Matt. Thank you. Thanks hi. a lot for the talk. Uh, uh, fantastic. So I found the work on the beta autoencoders to be super interesting in the sense that the artificial network sort of learned these distangled representations in its la uh, latent layers, right? Uh, so I was wondering if, if brains operated in a similar manner, what are these, what are the implications of such tweakable latent representations for like counterfactual thinking or imagination and creativity yeah. and things like that, where we can conjure up all these alternate realities at will 
and then and then go to town with it. So I was wondering what your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I um, uh, I have lots of thoughts on that, which are which derive um, in large part from my uh, my coworkers who've driven this work at DeepMind, and so the people I have in mind are Alex Lurchner, Irina Higgins, who 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 was mm -hmm. behind neuroscience app application. Um, uh, Loic Matthew, there's a group of people that they work in my team, but they're really uh, the, the the people who push this. So I want to give credit where credit is due. So the reason that they've been interested in disentangling is precisely because of the, the kinds of implications that you're pointing to. So, um, so you know, you can, the, the beautiful thing about these, these autoencoders is that the, the latent code is distributional. So e each of the mm -hmm. latent elements is giving a mean and a distribution. Um, and so, so if you imagine that the, the variance placed on one of these, um, these variables is very large, then mm -hmm. you're basically saying, I don't care about that, right? You, you know, so imagine you have a, a, a variable that's like uh, related to color or a set of variables that are related to color. And now you want to imagine, I don't know, a hat, but you don't, you don't care about the color. The color doesn't matter. You're just mm -hmm. trying to imagine a hat or think about a hat. Um, mm -hmm. Then, then, these models can express that because they simply put very large variants around around the color um, properties. I the see. fact that you have disentangled feature also allows you to um, to as as you were suggesting um, very flexibly uh, represent new combinations of mm -hmm. of, of features. Um, so mm -hmm. and in fact, this is this is why people got interested in the notion of disentangled features in the first place. Um, mm -hmm. So there, there's very lovely work uh, that was done by Irina and, and Alex and, and that group um, uh, showing that if you train uh, um, one of these uh, variational autoencoders that, that have nicely disentangled features on, uh, on um, a data set that includes um, a set of uh, generative uh, latent variables, say shape and color and location, mm -hmm. uh, but you hold out a particular combination. So let's say for the sake of um, description that you have uh, a data set that involves sprites that are like, you know, you have circles, you have squares, you have hearts, mm -hmm. and they come in different sizes and different colors and different locations that you can display. But you never show, let's say, a blue heart in the upper right-hand corner of the, mm -hmm. of the, um, of the uh, visual field. Mm -hmm. Um, now, if the system develops disentangled latents that, that code for shape and location and color, then what happens if at inference time, right, when, the, when learning is done, mm -hmm. if you just clamp those latents mm -hmm. so that they should represent a blue heart in the upper right-hand corner, something mm -hmm. that didn't occur in the data set, mm -hmm. will, will, will the inference model, uh, will the decoder um, be be able to generate an image of that? And the answer is yes, under the right see. conditions that can happen. So mm -hmm. it does provide a very nice way of thinking about how a human imagination is able to put together new new combinations of things that we, you know, the factors are familiar, but the combinations are, are novel. I see, yeah. okay. So at training time, was there was there a regular, regularizer that was sort of favoring uh, dis disentangled representations? Was that, was that? Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. all right, so, okay. Right. So that's, that's the beta in the beta VAE. So I see. Um, okay. the beta is a parameter that adjusts the um, the weight on the regularizer. And right. in, in, the, in these autoencoders, the, the regularizer says, try to keep the um, latent distribution close to a unit Gaussian. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. and, so, and, and so for kind of intuitive reasons, that leads to a, a disentangled yeah. representation. Turns out, turns out that when you really stare at the math, the, the the reasons that disentangled representations arise uh, are not actually quite so obvious. And there's been a lot of analytical work to try to figure out why this empirical result that mm. you get these disentangled representations, in fact, why, why, why it arises. But in practice, mm. there's also, I should just mention, since my talk was supposed to be about mainly about RL, uh, there actually is some work from that same group, Alex Lurchner, Irina Higgins and company, mm. uh, looking at um, RL, uh, um, using disentangled uh, feature representations, and and you can get um, some impressive generalization from that. I see. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. All right. Thank you, Deepak. I'll, I'll let you go. Um, and I brought Ben up on screen. Hi there. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes, we can hear you fine. 
We can't yeah, back I, to learning now, so please spend. <laughs> okay. Thanks for uh, taking my question. Um, so I guess I had one question about distributional learning that uh, was uh, from the talk. Um, I was really interested uh, that when you ask a deep network to predict an entire distribution instead of the single value, it actually is able to learn a richer distribute or richer representation of the states. Um, so like when you reconstructed the Pac-Man uh, screen. Yeah, and yeah. And yeah. I'm wondering, are there any other quantities that it would make sense to ask these agents to predict or learn to further improve that representation? I think you started talking about that with one of the prior questions. Yeah, I mean, this is um, so. So um, uh, you're referring to something that we talked about in in our paper. I think maybe even it was in the supplement. But uh, just for the benefit of the rest of the audience, um, I, I mentioned in, in in my lecture that uh, that using distributional codes for value and for reward prediction errors yield performance benefits in deep RL. And but I didn't really say why. And and in fact the history of, of that area of research is sort of funny because in fact uh, some very smart people including Will Dabney who is my one of my collaborators on this project uh, decided to try uh, distributional coding in DeepRL um, and they found that it really helped and then they realized that they weren't exactly sure why it, it was like it, then they had to answer then they had to figure out why it worked which is kind of a strange backwards way of um, research, uh, uh, especially engineering research proceeding. But in, in, in the end, they did get um, at least a partial answer. And, and the answer is probably multifactorial. But one part of the answer, which you were referring to, is that um, distributional codes lead to richer internal representations. And, and for the benefit of the rest of the, the group, the reason that that's the case is that if you're doing end-to-end -end learning, which is uh, the case that I mentioned in my in my lecture, where you're really relying just on reinforcement learning signals to shape internal representations, then any any two states that have the same value, their internal representations are going to tend to get smushed together. The distinction between those states is going to tend to be lost over time because they have exactly the same uh, implications for the output of the system, and so the gradients are going to be similar. So. Now, it, 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 if, you're, if you're considering a distributional representation, then you can, in at least some of those circumstances, you might have two states that have the same expected value, but that have different value distributions. And because in a in distributional case, you're trying to learn the full distribution, uh, the gradients will preserve a distinction between those two, those, the internal representations for those states. And having those, those internal representational distinctions could you know could, could turn out to be useful for subsequent learning? So that that's that's the Pac-Man example um, that um, was just referred to. So um, so okay. Uh, um, so the in fact so the question was: Are there other ways of encouraging that kind of benefit for representation learning? And in fact, um, there's a whole like subfield of research in in uh, in deep RL uh, that that um, attempts to leverage. Uh, that general strategy. In fact, the way that the way that Will Dabney um, explained the the benefits of distributional RL to me um, when I was when he was first uh, kind of letting me in on all of this was he said it effectively acts as an auxiliary task. Um, and the term auxiliary task is uh, is used in deep RL research to describe a situation in which you're asking an agent to um, to optimize some reinforcement learning objective, uh, which can either be, you know, updating its policy to follow uh, um, uh, uh, the gradient of rewards or uh, to update some value function like a Q function. But then you add some other task uh, that the agent has to do concurrently. And the, the whole point of adding this other task is just to get the system to learn better representations. And, and um, part of the logic behind that is, is that uh, when you don't add auxiliary tasks, the, the representations can get overfit to the RL task that you've given the agent. So you know, the particular task that you've given the agent, um, it, the, the representations that the system learns are gonna be tailored exactly to that task. Why, why wouldn't they be if, if the agent only ever has to solve this one task? So if you now want an agent that 
occupies a, a rich, interesting world where it has to perform a number of different tasks, if its representations are overfit to one particular goal that it decides to pursue, uh, then its, its internal representations are going to be impoverished. Imagine that I, every time I went into the kitchen, it was only to get a drink of water. You know, my, my attentional system would be completely dominated by, you know, the glass and the sink and uh, the water coming out of the tap. So if then somebody asked me to get blueberries out of the refrigerator, I would have no ability to do that. My representations would be terrible. And so, but if instead, every time I go in the kitchen, I have to get a glass of water, but my brain is also trying to predict a whole bunch of other things. Um, like, what will I see if I turn left? And how could I get uh, that pixel over there to turn yellow? Even rather arbitrary tasks like that um, can lead to much richer, uh, to much richer uh, representations. And so to add one more thing, to, this is kind of a callback to an earlier question. It's turning out right now that some of the most effective auxiliary tasks are simply prediction tasks, um, simply tasks that, that ask the system not only to minimize uh, um, an, an RL uh, loss, but also to accurately predict what's going to happen in the future. Because it turns out that being able to predict what's going to happen in the future is a great task for learning good latent representation of what's going on right now. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Sure. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, now, interestingly, so Ben has slipped in a somewhat different question than, than I actually was picking up on here, which, which interests me. So so I'll, uh, I'll come back to that now for you, Ben. Yeah. Um, there was the question around the, in the meta learning, um, the networks, do they learn with the same number of repetitions like an animal would learn? Or is it a lot more that they need? But then is it a fair comparison because animals have a lifetime of experience already? I mean, it's a very old question, but I thought it, I'd, I'd pull you up on it, Matt, and see what your take on it is. Yeah. It, it, so the good news is that at inference time, like at test time, you can see learning that resembles what you see in animals. So the, the meta-learning can lead to sample efficiency that's comparable, at least in simple tasks, like bandit tasks. Right. Uh, um, whether that effect will extend ultimately to the kinds of sample efficiency we see in human learners who are, say, learning a new video game. I, I don't know. I don't know whether we're going to be able to scale, scale these same methods up uh, to that sort of thing. Although, again, these, these gigantic language models are, are pretty intriguing in that regard. But to come to the point that you were making, I think you were talking about the pre-training data. Like, how much, how much does experience does it take to get the system to the point where it can make those rapid inferences? And, yes. um, and uh, that's a very dicey question, which I think is a little bit apples to oranges, and, and 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 it's for the reason that you it's for the reason that you flat right. So for me, it's not just for me, it's not just the question of how much experience did your human subject or your monkey or the baby that you're testing in the lab, how much experience did that individual have before you even started your experiment? Um, but even more problematic, there's the question of how much data was consumed, not by this individual, but by this individual's ancestors that was encoded into its genes. Um, and those genes ended up uh, building strong priors and biases into, uh, into the, the nervous system. So I, I, I explored some of these, um, these questions in a paper that some colleagues and I wrote for um, Trends in Cognitive Sciences a couple of years ago uh, called Reinforcement Learning Fast and Slow. And, and I, I, I do think, I, I actually think there's a, um, it's very hard to compare, it's very hard to compare these RL systems against biological organisms, simply because there's no, like there's simply no equivalent to the kind of evolutionary learning uh, that, that, that happened in, in biology. Um, having said that, having said that, um, you know, it's it's uh, it's clearly not satisfying from a like a psychology and neuroscience point of view um, to think of these gigantic language models as a simulation of of human uh, language acquisition. Even if you take evolutionary time into account, 
right. clearly, right. like I and my ancestors, there's no way that we even collectively have consumed as much language um, <laughs> as yeah. organic yeah. language models are collecting. So, so there is. I, I don't mean to be. I don't mean to be glib. There is. A, there is an issue about sample efficiency, but it's. But it's far from straightforward. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. I let you go, Ben. Um, sure. And it turns out, I mean, we, we actually already run out of time. Oh, and, wow. Uh, time flies. That, that was an hour. I wouldn't have thought it. Uh, we didn't get to absolutely everything, but I think we covered a good you know, amount of stuff in, 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 in quite some area. I, I will overrun a little bit for the benefit of asking you one quite general last you know, question um, sure. from the chair. I mean, you have an immense knowledge of the of the area reinforcement learning, uh, neuroscience. You have a good overview right now. If new young people want to enter the field, what what would be your advice? Where to start right now? What's the exciting thing they should be looking at? Um, yeah, it's a it's a complicated, disorienting time, isn't it? I mean, the um, not only because uh, technology is is changing so rapidly, but also because, um, you know, even just in terms of the way that uh, the world is organized into disciplines. I mean, uh, I think um, I'll give a more substantive answer in a minute, but I can't help reflecting that I think it came as a surprise to a lot of people when I moved from Princeton to DeepMind, you know, but, but since then it's become much more common for people to move from academic neuroscience into, into industry in this way. Um, and so there's like there's a whole new kind of realm of kind of job descriptions um, uh, uh, that makes I mean I talk to a lot of people who are thinking about their their graduate training and these these questions definitely arise for for people at that stage in life and and I I wish I had some sort of uh, sage advice that would make it all simple but uh, the best I can do is acknowledge the complexity of it but but let me answer your question in a more you know a more direct way so. Um, I, I feel like what's going on right now in, um, in neuroscience is uh, we have these amazing methods now uh, available um, from calcium imaging to optogenetics um, uh, and so forth, uh, you know, silicon probes. The, the data that we can acquire and the kinds of multimodal measurements we can make and the kind of causal interventions we can make and and the things that we are in a position to learn about architect like brain architecture it's just it's just incredible like the comparison to what we could do when I, even when i was a grad student is just um mind, mind blowing um but but at the same time my my personal view i, I hope this won't offend anybody but my personal view is that um there's there, there's right now there's a huge gap between the, the the sophistication of the methods that we have, and and like essentially what we're doing with them, I I, I feel like um, you know to me understanding a, an organ, a biological organ, uh, should be anchored in the question of what that organ is for, adaptively. Like what what it, like if you wanted to understand the kidney, you would say, well, what is this thing for? And and the answer is. Well, you know, it's it's for clearing metabolites from the blood, and and then you know, once you start studying the glomerulus, then you, you're grounded. You under like you, you know, you you know what you're trying to explain. And um and to me, the function of of the brain, like what the brain is for, is to generate behavior and to and to support cognition and um you know all of the things that are involved in something like you know, deep reinforcement learning. Um and so. I, I, I feel like there's an opportunity um, arising for us to to bridge that gap, to to get back to thinking about what the brain is really for, and these these deep learning models and these and these new reinforcement learning models. I think um, offer us a, a kind of a new ex and exciting laboratory for articulating that, for 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 building models of uh, you know what. The, what the brain is for, and if we, and so I think the challenge for the the next generation is to bridge that gap. Um, I found that a lot of the 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 labs that are leading the way on neuroscience methods are, you know, it takes such amazing expertise to just to just employ these methods at all 
that the people who run these labs can't possibly have expertise also in, uh, in, in, in AI. And, and so it's often falling to trainees uh, to, bridge, to, to, bridge those, to bridge those gaps. So, so um, if you're interested in these kinds of issues and pursuing them in, in uh, neuroscience, then um, my advice would be find, find a, like a graduate school or postdoc mentor who has amazing um, methods uh, available in their lab, but who is maybe not an expert on uh, something like deep RL, but let's say is deep RL curious. Um, and then offer to offer to like grow their research program in a way that starts to make contact with some of these computational issues. Because I think it's the younger generation that's going to, to drive that um, to drive that transition. That, that, that would be my advice. That sounds very, like very sound advice to me. Yeah. So if I might be a bit glib there right at the end, uh, so, so less receptive fields and more actual behavior. Yeah. <laughs> but right. Thank you very much, uh, Matt. Uh, that was a fantastic hour. I, I really enjoyed it. Um, it will also be available later as a recording. Uh, so, so people can watch it back and enjoy it uh, some more. It was a pleasure to have you for both sessions. Um, yeah, me, a pleasure for me too. Thanks. Thank you Great very time. much. Um, really, really good fun. Uh, and uh, I, I hope uh, we see you around, uh, you know, in, in the future. Thank you oh, very hopefully much. Hopefully in person someday. Yeah. Hopefully in person someday, indeed. And I'll thanks, close everybody. Thank you very much. Bye bye. <laughs>